think my passion for technology started when I was quite young, as a young girl. I was very lucky to be brought up in a family of people who were just sparked by technology. My grandfather was one of the first television engineers, which was a big thing at the time. And I really enjoyed playing with very basic computers. First playing games and then I learned to program when I was about eight years old in a language called BASIC. So I decided I would continue my passion for technology. I think the greatest challenge I have experienced was um, really around money as a student. It was very hard to be able to afford things like food. <laughs> I didn't eat very well and I was always skint and I think in some ways it impacted my studies because you can't study very well if you are hungry and um, so I have decided that I'm going to keep working hard and I think it's about just sticking with it and thinking about what the end goal is going to look like and how important it is just to keep trying to do the right things. I think the antidote really would be just um, how hard I've worked to get anywhere and that to get success you have to not be afraid to fail as well and I haven't succeeded at everything that I've tried to do. I think also it's about just keeping the long vision in your mind as you go along. So sometimes you can do projects and they don't turn out how you expect. And that can be usually people issues, not so much the technology. And I think it's so important to understand when to stop if something is not working. And I think that's probably something that's been quite a hard lesson to learn. I think also I've found that I've kept working in professional relationships which have not been good for me and I should have let go of them earlier. And now that I'm no longer in those professional relationships, my life has got better because I am able to focus on the things that I'd like to do rather than being really dragged around and into situations where they weren't right for me as an individual. I think that it's hard work, but I think it's also very rewarding. I think it's probably a really good idea to own and try to be excellent at everything you do. I found early in my career that if I was good at small things, then I was more likely to be trusted with bigger things. So if you find there's something that you can't do, and um, just keep practicing. But also don't ever think that anything is beneath you and that you should always try and do your best to own everything you do even if that thing doesn't seem very important at the time. You will earn respect because you have been successful in the small things as well as the large things. You won't get trusted with the large things unless you do the small things really well. So I would really encourage you to get stuck in, help your colleagues, help your teammates and just own everything and make sure you, that you carry it through to success. A good grasp of statistics is important. I think that's really fundamental because when you're in data science, a lot of it is statistics, a lot of it is working out the success or otherwise of the project and the modeling you've been doing. And it helps you to identify the last mile of analytics, which is really around making sure that you can put your models into production with confidence. And it also means that the business gets a good return on investment of the work and the efforts that you've spent in building all of those models and doing all of that work. So I think that's a really important issue. Some of the major challenges really involve people having the right skills. I think that there should be more training and I think that there should be more opportunities for people to practice and learn the skills that they need. I believe there's going to be a skill shortage in things like data science and AI. There will be a lot of people who say that they know it, but they don't actually know it. And I'm finding that. I'm finding there's quite a few charlatans. <laughs> so 
I think it's about making sure that whatever you do, you do with integrity. The real trend for Python is our technology. I think R is still popular, but I think that I'm seeing more and more Python and more requests from Python. I think also it's great to learn data visualization tools. So I'd recommend something like Power BI, Microsoft Power BI, uh, because it's free. People can go and download it. And you can really start to display the results of the efforts of the data science models that they've been producing. I also think you'll see more artificial intelligence being embedded in software. So in Microsoft Power BI, we can see that happening already. So I think that software will become more intelligent. In terms of the future of AI, that people's jobs will change. I think the AI will help to automate some of the easy things, but I think there will always be room for human intelligence. Um, I think artificial intelligence in a way will become automated intelligence. So take things like handwriting forms. Um, if those forms are handwritten, you might find that some an AI program could read that handwriting and then put that text into a database somewhere for further analysis. And that's something that a human could do. And what I think will happen is humans will still do that job, but they will get the harder handwriting to analyze rather than the easier, tidier handwriting. That's just one example where I think AI will automate and it will do the easy things, but I don't think it will do the hard things that require a human to be involved. I think it will help humans to do our jobs better and to be more productive. I think that female leadership can bring a different perspective. And the reason I believe that is because I think a diversity of voices and opinions is a good thing. I think that if you have a more diverse leadership, then you're more likely to have a better understanding of what your customers really want. And I think that's why companies have had such a focus on diversity and leadership, because they understand that by having all these different voices around the table, those voices are essentially the voices of the customer saying to the business, this is what we want. And that really fundamentally drives the business to be more successful. So I think um, people from diverse backgrounds generally bring diverse and honest opinions. I think they are not just bringing opinions, but also likely to question the accepted um, way that things are. There was an example recently where some of the airlines were accused of using data science to split families up on planes so that those families would be more likely to pay more to sit together. Now, I believe that actually no family person and no mother would think that that was a good idea. Families like to sit together. And my guess is what's happened is the people in that team have thought about what's technically possible, but not thought about the ethics of what they're doing. And I think that leaves a bad taste in your mouth as a consumer, because you think, well, why, why are they treating people so badly? They're not thinking about the customer. And I know that I think twice about buying tickets from an airline that thinks that behavior is acceptable. And I think female leadership in that example would come out and say, well, actually, you're not treating your customers reasonably. And if you're a mother, as I am, I just think that's a horrifying idea. And that idea, if, it, if I was running that team, would never get out the door. It just would not be implemented because it's bad for customers. And it, so if that fundamentally means it's bad for the company. I think the gap actually started, and I'll give you a year, 1984. And the reason for that is people were buying personal computers and they were buying them and putting them in their homes. But they were seen as boys' toys because the advertising at the time was very sexist and women were showed as 
appendages to the computer. So you might have a woman in a bikini next to a computer. And the reason she was there was she was not doing anything on the computer. She was just to attract the male gaze. So I think that the advertising really told everyone, men and women, that computers are for boys. And this meant that the generation growing up at the time really saw computers as a boy's thing and that women were not part of the story. Um, now we have female consumers who are making about 50% of the purchasing decisions. But we see that many of these electronic tools are still being made for men. So phones are sized for men's pockets and not women's pockets. Women's pockets tend to be smaller. So there's all sorts of reasons that is just ingrained in the way that we think that tells women that they are not included in technology. They can consume it and they can buy it, but they, they're not part of it. And I think that's a real shame. So how we get out of that really is back to square one in encouraging boys and girls to understand that technology is for them. Girls can be just every bit as good as programming that boys can. But if, I think also we need to tell girls the story that technology is a good tool in order to help people. And I think that's been one of my motivating ideas and in being involved in technology because I build projects which help people. And I think that opinion, that expertise, if you give that to young women, they'll understand that yes, they can actually help people using technology. It's another way that they can help. And um, so I think it would be good to really help our young women to understand and to see that there are opportunities there. And not just opportunities in technology and becoming better programmers, but also opportunities to do projects which have a really big impact on the world and the way that we live. The first name that springs to mind is Jen Underwood. Jen Underwood is a force of nature in analytics and if you don't know who she is I recommend you go and read her blog. She's incredibly insightful and I am privileged to count her as one of my friends as well. I think she's an amazing woman. She's a very giving woman as well so she just helps everyone and I think that's really such a crucial thing in technology particularly with women and we need to help each other it's not just about making men understand that there's a problem. Women have to lift each other up. There's a lovely saying which I saw somewhere, which is an example of a, of a female leader, is someone who spots that another woman's crown is crooked and fixes it for her without telling everyone and pointing it out. And I think that's a really nice way in which women can help each other as well and I think Jen Underwood's a fantastic example of that. I think she's probably my number one inspiration. Everyone should just do their best and give themselves options regardless of whether that's technology or in leadership. Give yourself as many options as you can and actually think that training yourself and investing in yourself is maybe a good thing to do now but it will be even better in the future. I think if you prepare now, you're preparing for the person that you will be in five years' time, that you will be in 10 years' time. And you can only invest in yourself more and more. And that's not just a financial investment, it's an investment of your time. And it's also an investment in how you choose to spend your time. And that would be my biggest piece of advice. Give yourself options and give yourself as many as you can.